thank you guys for being with me as always. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to talk about the buyer and the seller consultation. So we call this class Time for the Talk. And it's one of those classes where there's a lot of really good things in here that you can kind of take away as you're getting ready to do a buyer consultation or a seller consultation. So the question is, how do you master your consultation? Because at the end of the day, your ability, especially when it comes to buyers, your ability to really sit down and have this preemptive conversation before you go out there and start showing them properties is going to be exponentially more important and more valuable for you to end up not wasting your time. Now, a seller consultation is a seller consultation, and we're going to talk about that too. Uh, but a lot of the value in this class is understanding what a buyer consultation is and how to do it effectively, because so many agents just don't. They don't ever do a buyer consultation, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. So some of the objectives, how to walk through the buyer consultation, evaluating their wants and needs, doing the seller consultation with some tips and tricks, and then setting proper expectations. So let's go ahead and jump right in. When it comes to that buyer consultation, there's two things you're looking to accomplish. You wanna educate them and you wanna set their expectations. So we wanna clarify what the home buying process is. We wanna set their expectations for both you and them and then lay that foundation for a happy client agent relationship. So here's what I found. Buyers, even buyers who have been through the process before, by and large, do not understand all the things that need to happen from the very beginning of I'm getting started to the end. They just don't know. And a lot of times, agents don't do a very good job at conveying our knowledge. You know, we kind of take for granted, especially those of us who have been an agent for a while, we just take for granted all the things that happen, especially from the time we get a contract executed until we get to closing. And I was talking to somebody the other day, it was another agent, and they were kind of venting about how their customers have no loyalty and they just you know, feel like they're being taken for granted. And I asked the question, I said, do you ever stop to tell your customers what it is that you do? And he kind of stopped for a minute and thought about it. And he was like, well, no. So I said, okay, well, how can you expect that your customer is going to appreciate all the things that you do if you never tell them? And he kind of sat back in his chair for a second. And he was like, yeah, I mean, I guess you're right. Because we know all the things that happen in the background of a deal. But for the most part, we do a pretty good job at shielding our customers from all of that stress. So what I have always done, and one of the things that I have always been really proud of, is as I was going through a transaction, as I was going through it, I let the buyer know, here's what's happening. So I typically did a weekly update. And the weekly update was usually in the communication style of their preference. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, but in that weekly update, it may be, hey, nothing new changed this week. You know, this has been ordered. This is done. This is working in the background. Title's doing this. Your lender's doing that. But what it did was it let that customer know, specifically that buyer know, that I'm still working on their deal, even though they're not hearing from me every day. Because a lot of buyers have this idea that, we write a contract, we kind of, and it's more true on the seller side. We stick the sign in the yard, we get the contract executed, and then we don't do anything until closing. And the more I talk to agents, the more I realize why the public thinks that. Because we really do not do a good job at conveying what it is that we're doing. We just go do it. So one of the things that I've always done is just those weekly check-in calls. Hey, nothing new to report this week. I just want to let you know. I talked to your lender. Um, everything's moving along fine there. Talk to the title company. Everything is good. Spoke to the seller's agent. Everything is fine there. Everything is good. Just want you to know we're still moving forward. 
coming up, here's what we have in the next week or two. You know, our, excuse me, our financing contingency period ex expires. That's not a big deal. I talk to your lender, everything's on track. They already have you in underwriting, whatever the case may be. But in communicating those things, you establish a level of appreciation that shows you're not just an agent that writes a contract and then collects a commission check. You know, we do so much more than that, but most people have no idea. They just don't know. And most agents don't do a very good job at communicating that. So what I would say is right from the beginning, set those expectations. As a buyer or as somebody who's looking to purchase a home, here's what I expect from you. I expect that you're going to find a lender. And if you don't already have one, I have a couple I can send you to. You're gonna find a lender and you're gonna get pre-approved. Because in this market, unless you're pre-approved, you're not a real buyer. There are a lot of sellers because of the demand that they have that are not letting non-pre-approved buyers in their home. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. I don't want just anybody coming through my house because there's so many buyers right now then unless you're serious, I really don't want you in my house. And that's how a lot of sellers feel. So I kind of use that as a way to say, listen, to be, to be able to get into your dream home, we need this sheet of paper that says, you've submitted your documents to a lender, you are a real buyer able to afford this home, and we can take you to see it. So that's my first expectation. My second one is, if a lender asks you for something, you know, once we get into the process, you're going to provide it to them within 24 hours. That's my expectation. Because not providing the lender with what they need can cause delays. And if you are the cause of delay, then you risk losing your escrow. Because the contract very clearly states that the buyer is going to exercise due diligence and effort to get that loan approved. Well, if I'm the seller's agent and I call the lender and the lender says, I've been chasing this buyer down for two weeks trying to get this document, and that's why I need an extension, I'm going to be a lot less likely to give you that extension because the buyer did not exercise due diligence and effort, and they're not going to get their escrow back because they violated that clause of the contract. So I tell my buyers this right up front you're going to put money into escrow and that money is contingent on you exercising due diligence and due diligence and effort. So that means if your lender asks you for something, you need to get it to them as fast as you possibly can because we are on a very tight time frame and your money depends on it. And that's usually enough to kind of spur them to go, "Oh, okay, cool." Because they know that right up front. If you get into the deal and then go, oh, hey, I need you to scramble to get this whenever the lender asks for it, they feel like it's an imposition to them. They feel like, you know, well, why didn't he ask for it before? Why didn't they, you know, whatever. Let them know right up front, the lender is going to ask you for things. And sometimes they're gonna ask you for the same thing more than once. Give it to them. Keep copies of everything you send to them because you might have to do it again. That's just the way lending goes. One part cannot talk to the other part and they're not allowed to share this information. So as a result, they may have to get it from you again. That's normal. It's not that the lender is doing anything wrong. That's just the process. So when you can set those expectations up front, what you find is your buyer tends to be a lot less frustrated with the process because they know what to expect. What I found of human nature is people don't mind putting in the work if they know up front that they have to. Where they get frustrated is if they think it's going to be one way and then all of a sudden it becomes something else. That's when you start to lose buyers or start to lose people in general. So be upfront about what this process looks like. It's going to be stressful. There are things that are going to go wrong. The good news is, this is what I do for a living, and I am very, very good at what I do. Give them that comfort that they are working with the right agent. Because they may not have had 
a good experience with their past real estate agent and they may have some apprehension about what it is that you do. So the home buying process offers a unique set of opportunities and challenges and they can be stressful. They will be stressful. There's no way around it. I don't care if it's a cash deal that's closing in 14 days. There's going to be something, always. Set that expectation. They're not only choosing an agent, they are also choosing a trusted advisor. You are assisting them with the largest purchase they will probably ever make in their life. Don't take that for granted. Understand the complication and the apprehension that somebody has when they're making the biggest transaction of their life and never ever take that for granted. When you can put a plan in place up front, it will help ensure a smoother and more enjoyable transaction. Just let them know what they're in for. That's where you really set yourself up for success. So before your meeting, okay? So, and I would encourage you guys, when you're working with a buyer, set up an initial meeting. This meeting can be at the office. It can be anywhere you want, Starbucks, Panera, as long as there's a Wi-Fi. Okay, and I'll show you why. But before your meeting, use your spy capabilities. Google them, find them on social media, look into them, see if you have any mutual friends, find out anything you can about this customer. If they have kids, I don't know why it says prepaid, it should have been prepared. Be prepared with activities to keep them busy. A tablet, coloring books, toys, this is a good thing to keep in your car. I always had a, a box and it had, you know, a big box of crayons, a couple of coloring books. Um, sometimes it would have like a board game or like the little travel games, the magnetic checkers and stuff. Um, I would typically keep those things in my car. So that way, if they bring the kids along, which with COVID, that's not happening as much now, but a lot of times they would bring, you know, their kids and stuff to the showing. So what I would do is when we'd walk into the house, I would set the kids up in a room and go, hey, while we're looking around, here's a coloring book, here's some crayons, here's some colored pencils. Why don't you color your parents a picture? And that way, if you need anything, just let me know. And that gave the parents a chance to walk around without the kid going, mom, 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 mom. And then they're so distracted that they're not actually paying attention to what's in the house. One other thing that I always did is there's a company and I meant to look it up before the class. It's like real estate tools or real estate something. Um, but they had these notebooks and you could buy them for a few dollars a piece. And what it did is the first five or 10 pages had sheets that were specific to looking at homes. So what I would have them do is I would give them a pen and this notebook when we first went out. And I would say, listen, as we walk through the house, I want you to write the property address at the top and I want you to make notes about what you like and what you don't like as we go through. Now, I always, when I was showing a buyer, I would print out the broker synopsis and the customer synopsis. And I would always print them front and back. So what I would have is on the back of my paper, I would have my clipboard or my notebook or whatever. And as we're walking through that property, as I hear the buyer make comments, oh, I really like this open concept or whatever the case may be, I would jot down those notes. I don't like the carpets in the bedroom. The walls are really dark. Um, you know, the pool is really dirty. It doesn't have a fenced in backyard. Whatever it is that they said, I would be jotting notes on this paper. So that way, as they came back and they're like, oh, you know, what about 123 Main Street? I can pull out that sheet and go, oh, that was the one that had the burgundy carpets in the bedroom and the one that didn't have the fenced in backyard. And, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. These are the kinds of things that would be helpful. Always have a buyer's packet ready in your FLR folder. So let's see, what have I got in here? Hang on. Okay. 
So you have your Florida luxury folder, right? So I would encourage you guys when you have one of these to take, I have my background on so it may not work. No, it's not gonna work. On the one side, I want you guys to go in and put your buyer forms, your uh, buyer brokerage agreement, whatever it is, put that on one side. And then on the other side, when you go into the back office and you go into the buyer marketing pieces or buyer handouts rather, you can actually go in there and have a few that are pertinent to most buyers. So it'll have your introduction letter kind of introducing you if this is somebody you don't know very well. You can do like some things to look at, whatever it is, there's a bunch of them in there. And I would encourage you. Oh, all right. I would encourage you to go in there and have some of those in your folder ready to go. So that way, when you go to show that property, you're gonna have the MLS sheets of the properties you're gonna look at in order in there. So when they open this folder, they're gonna see all that information delivered in the way that no agent has ever presented it to them before. Most agents are just gonna hand them MLS sheets and then walk through the houses. But when you show up with this Florida luxury folder, it's really going to convey that luxury. And in doing so, it's gonna set you apart as an agent. Because what I want you guys to do is I want you to think about working future referrals and things like that. These are the things that you can do up front that are gonna make you far more desirable in the future, okay? Have coffee or some other beverage, get yourself hydrated and, you know, ready to go. And then I want you to take a deep breath and just relax. Okay, just relax. Because at the end, if you walk in there stress and tense and all of that, it's going to convey. I want you to be nice and relaxed. You're going to consult with this buyer. You're going to meet them at Panera or Starbucks or at the office or whatever. And I want you to go in there confident. I want you to feel good about what you're doing. And I want you to be nice and calm. Okay. So sharing is caring. When you first get in there, it's okay to take a couple of minutes and talk about yourself. And I know this seems kind of counterintuitive, but at the end of the day, talk about what it is that you do that other agents don't. Talk about why you're meeting up with them and how it will help you to better serve them. Explain the value in a buyer consultation. Because to a buyer, they just want to go look at houses, right? Oh, I want to go look at this house. Okay, great. Before we do that, I want to have a consultation with you. I want to sit down and understand what we're looking for because that house may not be what you're looking for. And I don't want to waste a bunch of time showing you properties that are not specifically correct for you. So I always, always, always do a buyer consultation. I just always have. And there is so much value that comes out of it. Sometimes the buyer is going to push back on it and go, no, I don't really want to do a consultation. I just want to go look at houses. That's not how I run my business. It's just not. Because at the end of the day, there's a level of service that comes in to understanding you and your desires and your criteria that's going to set you up for success. I believe in that process and I stick to it pretty firmly. Once you've kind of explained a little bit about who you are and what you do, get to know them, their family size, ages, schools, hobbies, familiarity with the area, if they have family or work nearby, how long they plan to stay in this home. All of these things are going to help you kind of put this puzzle together. It's also going to show that you care about them as people, not just them as a paycheck. Because to them, so many real estate agents view them as a paycheck. They don't view them as a customer or a client or a long-term 
person that they're going to spend time with, they're viewed as a paycheck. And that gets shown. They feel that. So I would encourage you not to do that. And that's where this buyer consultation really comes into play. Set up your communication expectations. And I touched on this a little bit earlier in the first slide. How do they like to be communicated with? By text, by email, by phone, all the above? Are there any times that are off limits? You know, maybe they go to church on Sunday or Saturday night or, you know, anytime the bucks are playing, they don't want to be bothered, whatever. I've had a bunch of really crazy like, hey, on Tuesdays from 10 to 12, don't call me. Okay, cool. I make notes of all of this. I put it in their profile. All these notes get saved in their profile. Or would you expect to be informed around the clock? Anytime something changes, do you want me to let you know? Sometimes people are like that. Every time there's a change, every time something happens, they wanna know about it. Okay, no problem. I typically do a weekly check-in call or check-in, whether it's a text or a phone call or an email, whatever they prefer. But I check in once a week and it was usually on Tuesdays. So on Tuesday afternoons, I had time blocked out in my schedule where I would follow up with every deal that I had in the works. And sometimes I had six, eight, 10 deals in the works at the same time in varying stages. So I'd have sellers, I'd have buyers, I'd have lenders, I'd have title companies, I'd have all these people that I needed to touch base with. So I would carve out a few hours in my Tuesday afternoon and that's what I did. And then after that, I would touch base with every single one of my customers. Hey, just wanted to let you know, here's what's going on. Talk to the lender, talk to the title company, talk to the appraiser, talk to all these people. Here's where we are. Here's what's going on. Here's what I foresee on the horizon. You know, whatever that is. I was always, always, always very good to communicate in a consistent manner. Now, I would call them at other times when it warranted it, but for the most part, when you're in that dead zone in the middle where, you know, you don't really have a good reason to talk to your buyer for two or three weeks in the middle, I would still find a reason to reach out to them because I'm building that relationship. I'm providing that level of customer service that they never received from any other agent they worked with before. Because I don't view my customers as one transaction. I view them as a relationship and a referral source for exponentially more future business. So you have to tweak the way that you think about your business and the way that you think about your customers. And a big part of that comes from this buyer consultation. So I have a question for you guys that are in the class and that are watching this class later. If you've been in my classes before, you should know the answer to this. But what are the three things that you need in order to get a customer to give you their business and their loyalty? Trust. Trust. What else? I don't want to take up all the answers. <laughs> so Crystal said they have to trust you, like you, and know you. So there you go. They have to know you, like you, trust you. Those are the three things that you have to have for customer loyalty. They have to know you exist and that you have a real estate license. They have to like you because I don't wanna work with people I don't like and they have to trust you. They have to believe that you are looking out for them. That's where your buyer consultation comes in because at that point, they fully realize that you are not just about chasing a paycheck with them, but you are working to find the right home for them. You're truly working for them. That's how they get to trust you. So the next part of it is you've got to educate them. Ask if they bought or sold a home previously. If so, when? And what was their experience like? Give them an opportunity to talk about it. Because when they come in and go, you know what? I bought two houses before. And honestly, it was the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life. My agent didn't communicate. I felt like I was totally alone. 
My lender just asked me for the same set of documents 47 freaking times, and I couldn't understand why. Cool. Let's talk about that. Because at the end of the day, you are here to be that expert. Give them an opportunity to talk about what happened in the past. Maybe their experience was fantastic. It probably wasn't. Because the more I worked with buyers and the more I took them on and worked with them, the more I found that there were a lot of fallacies in the real estate industry. There were a lot of agents that did not do it properly. And it's really unfortunate. But what that showed me was it made my value so much higher because I could convey what I was doing even though their previous agent probably did it, they had no idea. So when I actually told them all the things that I was going to do for them, when I educated them on the process and said, hey, listen, here's what is happening. Here's what to expect. Even people that had bought multiple homes before, they were like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. That makes so much more sense now. Nobody ever bothered to tell them. Now, after you ask those questions and talk through it, the second part of the consultation is to share with them. Share current market conditions. Because it may have been the last time they bought a house was 2011 or 12 or 13 or 14, where the market was considerably different. Where they could come in and submit these lowball offers and get them accepted. Educate them on what's going on right now. A home that is marketed properly and priced properly is going to receive multiple offers in the first week on the market, guaranteed. That's the market we're in right now. So this idea that if it's listed for $299 and you want to come in and offer $275, don't bother. Because they're going to get multiple offers at asking price or maybe even more. So I need you to be prepared to make a sizable and considerable offer because the days of lowballing do not exist in this market. They just don't. You're not even going to get considered. But when they bought before, that was their strategy and it may have gotten them the good deal on their home. That's awesome. But that's not the market we're in right now. And they have no idea. They just think this is how real estate is done. You come in there, you make a low ball offer, they counter, you find something in the middle that you can both live with and you go on and close. It's not our market. Educate them, take the time to make them understand what we're looking at. Well, how do we educate them? FloridaRealtors.org. When you go into the Florida Realtor website and go into tools and research, you're going to find property reports and market statistics, okay? So these are all things that are really, really helpful for you. When you come into the market reports, it'll show the data on this page is current as of, and in this class, I'm just using the one for March 2020. I just didn't update it. So you can go in and show statewide reports. You can show MSAs, which is the Metropolitan Statistical Area. So it will show you, you know, whatever area you're looking at, whether it's Tampa Bay or Pasco County, Pinellas County, Sarasota, Orlando, whatever the case may be, they have them for all of them. This is publicly available. So as members only, you get to detail what you want. You can do it by month, you can do it by quarter, whatever you're looking for, or they just have a monthly or quarterly public one, which has a lot less detailed information. And then you can also do it by county. So you can do it in a month, you can do it by county. All of this stuff is available to you. This is how you show that what you are saying is true. So let's look at Pasco County for March, 2020. Median sales price was 240. A year ago, it was 220, which is a 9% growth year over year. Okay, so if you were looking in March of 19 and had a budget of 220,000, you were right in the median. If you're now March 2020 with that same $220,000 budget, you are now well below the median price. 
you're not gonna be able to buy that same house this year. This property went up 10% year over year. Median time to contract in March of 19, it was 42 days. In March of 20, it was 32 days. That's almost a 25% drop in days on market. This is when we started to kind of see that shift into a seller's market where those sellers are getting their homes under contract faster. Here's the other thing. In March of 19, we had 1,100, almost 1,200 homes. In March of 2020, we had 950. So we had almost 20% less inventory available than we did a year before. So we had 2.6 months of inventory before. We're down to 2.1 in March of 2020. Right now, I think we're down in like 1.6. Our inventory or our month supply of inventory is like ugh, nothing. These are the things that help show them what is changing. What are we up against? The median home price in March of 2020 was 97.4% of ask. 97.4%. So if a home was listed for 250,000, they were under contract for 244, 245. Right now, I think we're at something like 98 or almost 99% of list price. And the reason that we're seeing that 97 is they were going under contract for something close to 100%, but then an appraisal came in low. And so they had to drop it a bit or whatever the case may be. So these are the things to take in mind. So if somebody wants to come in and offer 10% less than asking price, well, no, we're closing at 97.5% of ask. There's no way that a seller is going to accept 10% under. There's no reason to because 32 days to contract, and this is at all price points, mind you. The ones that are under 300,000 are considerably less than 30 days. The ones over half a million take a little bit longer, but averaged out, 32 days is our average. Now, when we come in here, so year to date, median sales price was 236. In March of 2020, it was 240, changed 9.1% year over year. Uh, you can actually go back and show 220, 213, 223, 230, 238, 240. 236, 229, 245, 45, 30, 37, 40. So this kind of shows we had a couple where we went up and down that kind of fluctuated a little bit. But at the end of the day, aside from April of 19, and I don't remember what happened in April of 19 that caused us to have a dip in percent change, um, but pretty much every other year, we're hovering around 10% growth year over year. So that means the home from when it was purchased in March of 19 to March of 20 went up 10%. That's crazy. 10% growth year over year. This is why we have kind of the market that we have. And it's important to use these statistics to show that, to paint that picture. Because if you were looking at 220, and that house went up 20%, that same house is 240 this year. The exact same one you looked at a year ago. So your buying power is going down every day you wait. Essentially 1% a month. You lose 1% of your buying power every single month that you wait. These are the kinds of things in your buyer consultation that you can use to help get them off the fence and into the car. You can do closed sales by sales, uh, closed sales by sales price. So we can see that we had 200 closed sales, actually pretty close, and the 300, 200, you know, down in the 150s and 100 to 150. This is your sweet spot, even up to the 399. Now we're watching this 400 price point drop off a little bit. But in Pasco County, this was artificially high because of all those new construction. Um, all the stuff in Starkey and Astoria and Bexley and Land O'Lakes, um, all of those are carrying this three to $400,000 price point. 
So that's why we're seeing it. But if you notice, every single bit of this is going up pretty significantly. In the two to 250, we had a four and a half percent growth. In the 150 to 200, we had a 10 percent growth. In 250 to 299, we had a 43 percent change year over year. We are seeing the vast majority of the properties available in that 250 to 300 price point. These are the kinds of things. Now, as we look at that 50 to 100, it went under contract in 15 days, 25 days, 25 days, 34, 53, 42, 54, right? So when we look at this less than 50,000, it took longer because a less than 50,000 is gonna be teardowns or things that you probably wouldn't wanna live in. So that's why that kind of artificially inflates that. But all these other 15 to 30 days, they're gone. So what that means is if you are not pre-approved, we're not going to be able to get you into this house because you're going to miss out. We can't write an offer until you have that pre-approval. And in the 24 to 48 hours it takes for that lender to get you approved, that house is probably gone. So that's why I'm such a stickler about making sure that we do this the right way, right from the beginning. Because as a real estate professional, I want to set you, the buyer, up for success. It is so important to me that if you find your dream home, because that's what I do, I find people their dream home. And when I find that dream home, I work like hell to get you into it. But you got to work with me. There's only a couple of things that I need from you, but this is a big one. I don't ask for much, but what I do ask for, I need you to do. And one of them is getting pre-approved with a lender. That's it. I've got, you've got to do it for me. Again, you are the professional. So distressed, everybody's like, oh, I want, you know, a distressed property. Okay, cool. Traditional homes, there were 987 in March of 2020. REOs, there were 30. 30. A thousand regular homes, 30 foreclosures, six short sales in the entirety of Pasco County. REOs don't exist. You're talking what, 0.3%? of the total market is a foreclosure. Okay, cool, it doesn't exist. Here's the other thing, 987 properties, median sales price 242, right? Short sales, six of them with an average sales price of 285. So your short sales are more expensive than your traditional sales. You're not getting a bargain. They don't exist. But everybody thinks, I want to buy a bank owned foreclosure. Sweet. Why? Oh, because I can make a really good deal. These banks are charging full retail for these REOs. And this is what I said in my class about bank owned foreclosures looking forward to next year. There will be more foreclosures in 2021. Because all of these people who have not been paying their mortgage because of COVID and things like that, the minute this moratorium lifts, and right now uh, with the president signing the bill last night, it got extended to January 31st. Unless it gets extended again on January 31st or February 1st, all of these, and I have a friend that's a real estate attorney that told me he has a stack of foreclosure of Liz penances that are ready to be filed with the court the minute this expires. So all of these people that are you know, way past due on their mortgages, these banks are gonna foreclose on them as fast as they can ram these through the courts. Now the courts are gonna get backlogged pretty quickly, but understand even with all these foreclosures, there will not be bargains because the days of a bank saying, hey, the mortgage is 130, I wanna sell it for, the 130 that's owed to me are gone. They're having these REO agents do CMAs on these properties to find out what they're actually worth. So the banks are recouping their losses 
and then some. They're not stupid. The days of just selling for whatever they were owed are gone. The days of coming in and telling a bank, I see you've got it listed for 185, I'll give you 150. Those are gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Because the banks know there are enough buyers out there who will pay full retail, there's not gonna be a deal. So out of a thousand homes that were available, 36 of them were REOs or short sales. And there's a huge demand for those 30 properties because everybody thinks they're getting a deal even though they're gonna end up paying more than they would if they bought from an individual owner. Because here's why. When you buy from a bank, they will not make any alterations, modifications, or adjustments to that property. They just won't. So a buyer goes in, pays full retail, mind you, does not get any of the inspection items addressed, and then has to spend money after closing to fix those things. You've now paid more than if you just went and negotiated with a regular seller who probably would have made those repairs for you. But everybody has this idea that REO foreclosures are absolutely the way to go. They're not, they're just not. One, they don't exist. And two, they're not bargains. But this is where you get to be the expert. And all of this comes from the Florida Realtor website. So we need to establish what are their wants and what are their needs? What are they looking for? What type of home? What are their location considerations? How many bedrooms or bathrooms? Do they need a yard or an outdoor space? Is that important to them? Are they looking for move-in ready or are they okay with something that needs a little bit of remodeling? What size do they need? What is your price range? What are your top five priorities? These are the things that I want to establish in a buyer consultation before we go look at homes. Because I don't want to go driving all over creation you know, showing them properties from Spring Hill to Sarasota just because it's in their price point if they work in, you know, Citrus Park, let's just say. Okay, cool. Well, it doesn't make sense to show you Spring Hill or Sarasota where you're going to have over an hour drive to work each way because by the time you spend the money and time and gas, you're going to get frustrated. Let's hone in on those areas that are going to fit your desire. Trust me, I drive 45 minutes to the office every day. I get it. Most people don't want to do that. So these are the kinds of things that in this buyer consultation, you can do with them. You can talk through with them. You can show your value. It's not enough to say, I want a three bedroom, two bathroom home. Sweet, there's about 400 of those. I need more than that. But with most agents, that's kind of where they stop. They set up a search in the MLS for three bedroom, two bathroom houses in Pasco County under 299,000. Cool. Are you really serving your customer that way? No. No, you're copping out. But that's what most agents do. So this is where I'm teaching you guys to be different. The next one is the pre-approval and I've harped on this. Are you currently working with a lender or do you need a referral for one of my preferred lenders? Send them a couple. Here's the one I would recommend, but here's a couple others just in case. Sometimes it comes down to personality. Sometimes it comes down to communication style. It's not always about who has the best rate. A lot of times they all have pretty much the same rate. Eh. All right. They all have pretty much the same rate. So they want somebody that they feel comfortable working with. Give them a couple of options. Explain why it's critical that they get approved now. And I kind of talked about that. So I'm not gonna to continue to harp on it. Now, we're gonna find their 80% perfect home. What does that mean? Okay. A home is going to be broken into two lists, my must-haves and my wishes, okay? So 
I'm going to find you a home that has all of your must haves and as many of your wishes as possible. But if I can find you a home that has all of your musts and a few of your wishes, it's your perfect home. And I set this expectation right up front. Tell me what your home must have. If it doesn't have at least three bedrooms, I'm not gonna look at it. If it doesn't have a fenced in backyard, I don't wanna look at it. If it doesn't have a pool, I don't want it. If it doesn't have an open kitchen, I don't want it. If it has, you know, an office space, if it doesn't have an office space, I won't look at it. Whatever it is, whatever it must have, put that in your list. And then what do you wish it have? Well, I really would like to have granite in the kitchens and bathrooms. I would like to have no carpet, but you know, if there's carpet in the bedrooms, I can live with that. Um, I would like to have a screened in back porch, but if it's an open back porch, I'm okay with that too. I'd like to have a pool, but it doesn't have to. I wouldn't necessarily pass one up if it didn't have one. You know, at least maybe having a space to put a pool in later. Um, I would like to have something that is single story. I don't wanna have it upstairs, but if it's like maybe just a bonus room above the garage, I could deal with that. These are the kinds of things that are good to know. So if you find a house that has 80% of their total, so all of their musts and some of their wishes, that's a perfect home. Set that expectation with them. If you think we're going to find all of this list and all of this list in your price point, it probably doesn't exist. So we're going to have to give somewhere. There's going to be a little bit of concession, give and take, somewhere. I won't make you give up your must-haves, but you may not be able to get all of your wishes. But I need you to understand that this is still your perfect home. Sometimes agents get so caught up on, it needs to have 100% of everything. That's great. Are they willing to add another zero to their budget? No. Well, then I can't get them their perfect home. So you're going to spend a year trying to find their perfect home. Meanwhile, you lose 1% in buying power every single month that you look, and they get farther and farther behind because their budget's not going up. They're not making more money, but their ability to afford their dream home gets smaller every day. These are the kinds of realities that I need you to set for your customers. Because at the end of the day, you're the professional. This is what you do. You are looking out for them. You are setting them up for success. You don't set them up for success by telling them what they want to hear. You set them up for success by telling them what they need to hear. Are you the agent that's willing to tell them what they need to hear? Because as a good one, I did. And I never had a customer that was like, oh my God, I can't believe you told me that. I can't believe you said that to me. Why? I could lie to you and watch your buying power get smaller every month, but that, how does that help me? How does that help you? At the end of the day, I am here to help you get into your perfect home, but I need you to have realistic expectations about what your perfect home actually is. I need you to be realistic with me. And I, in turn, will be realistic with you. Every month, you lose 1% of your buying power. It's just the reality of it. So these are the kinds of things that you need to be able to do in a buyer consultation. According to the National Association of Realtors, 93% of the buyer surveyed considered knowledge of the purchase process to be very important when choosing an agent. 93%. They want to know that you understand the process. But probably 80% of real estate agents never convey that knowledge to their customer. 93% of buyers want it, but the majority of agents never do it. 
So what does that tell you? You need to do it. You need to show that you have the knowledge of that purchase process and that you are qualified to walk them through it. You are going to get so much more business by showing that you are qualified than just assuming that they know you're familiar. So now we get to our first date, okay? We've had our consultation. We've talked through what it is that they have to have. I've gone back. I've set up how it's done. It's actually, it's on the next one, so that's fine. We're gonna look at homes. I want consistent feedback. I want you to tell me what you think of each home as we go through it. Once you've found the one, your perfect home, we're going to make an offer. You're gonna make formal application with the lender. You're gonna deposit your earnest money. I explain what earnest money is and how it gets used. We're gonna have an inspection. I'm gonna to explain to them what an as-is contract actually means. We're gonna have appraisal and survey ordered. We're gonna put the buyer through final underwriting and then we're gonna to go to closing. I explain each step of this process because now they feel empowered because they know what to expect. You're not surprised. Oh, you mean I have to put money into escrow up front? Yep. Does that money come back to me? Guys, I can't tell you how many buyers don't think that that escrow money gets credited back to them at closing. They think that's money they have to put up to buy the house that they don't ever get back because nobody ever explained it to them. It's one of those things that to us is totally logical. Of course that money is gonna get credited back to you at closing. It's your money. But to them, they hear, okay, this money gets put into escrow. They don't ever expect to see it again. So that's why it's so important that we explain this process to them. We're gonna order inspections. <clears throat> the inspections are something that get paid for at the time it's done. So it's about $500 that you need to have on top of your closing costs, on top of your loan down payment, it's about $500 to have that inspection done. By the time you do a full home inspection, the four point, the wind mitigation, the termite, if you need to have a well and septic, all these things, this is money you're going to have to come out. So are you prepared for that? Okay, cool. Appraisal and survey. Those typically get paid at the time they're ordered. So again, this is part of your closing costs, but these are things that are going to come out of pocket before you get to closing. This is money you need to have readily available because an appraisal could be 350 to 700 bucks that you're gonna to have to stroke a check for. Are you prepared for that? And we're gonna put you through on final underwriting. The final underwriter may ask for more documentation or letters or a bank statement or an updated pay stub or any number of things. Be prepared for what they might ask for and be ready to give it to them within 24 hours. Be proactive about this process. And then we're gonna to get to closing. So always remember to ask if they have questions because buying a home is a big deal. The only silly question is the one you didn't ask. And I tell them this right up front. Guys, there are no stupid questions. I'm a professional. I do this all day, every day. This is my job. So for me, it's totally logical. I may not even think that you would have a question about it, but it doesn't make it a stupid question. But I need you to ask me those questions and not be afraid to ask questions, even if they're personal, if they're uncomfortable, if they're whatever, that's okay. There are three people you don't lie to. You don't lie to your doctor, you don't lie to your attorney, and you don't lie to your lender or your mortgage person. I guess technically that's four, but I join those two together. Don't lie to me. If something is going on and you're worried about something in the process, let me know because there are ways we can get out ahead of it or we can be a bit proactive, but don't wait until the last minute and then surprise me with it. 
let's try to be more proactive. So if you know of something that might be a problem, let's talk about it. I don't need to know your credit score. I don't need to know your income. I don't need to know any of those things. That's for the lender, but don't lie to your lender. Be honest and let's talk through it and let's work through it. Remind them that you're their realtor and you're gonna be there to hold their hand, answer their questions and guide them through the process. That's my job. And I'm very, very good at my job. I'm here to help you. I'm here to coach you. I'm here to walk with you every step of the way. This is what I do. Not every real estate agent does that. And I know that, but this is what I do. This is why you're hiring me. Sorry, this is why you're working with me because I know what I'm doing and I'm here to make sure we make this as painless and as smooth as possible. So do you guys have any questions about the buyer console, anything that we covered in there before we move on to the seller side? And the seller side is much, much shorter. No questions? All right, so let's talk about the seller consultation. As you're preparing for the appointment, make sure that you have your CMA prepared. If you guys haven't yet, watch my class on CMAs. Uh, I walk you through how to do it step by step. Practice your listing presentation so that you sound polished and professional. This is important because when you're doing a seller consultation, you want to sound like the expert. You don't want to fumble and stumble through it and act like you don't know what you're doing. It's not going to work. You've got to be polished and you've got to be professional. With a buyer, there's a lot more leniency, I guess, ability to kind of fumble your way through it when you don't know what you're doing. On the seller side, you've got to know. You just got to know. It's not hard. It's not difficult to learn, but when you come in there to do a listing presentation, if you're like, I, uh, I, uh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to get the house sold. Does that elicit a lot of confidence? No. And if they're paying you to sell their house, they need to feel confident that you know what you're doing. Even if you don't, they need to believe you do. Prior to arriving at the appointment, drive around the neighborhood. Get a feel for the look and the feel of it. Pay attention to whether special signs are required. There are some communities like those in Trinity that require the green signpost and the green Trinity sign, no matter what company you're with. This is important to know because if you stick the wrong sign in their yard, and they get a nasty letter from the HOA, it's not gonna reflect well on you. They're gonna be pretty perturbed. So pay attention, just drive around the neighborhood. Take five minutes and just drive around. Look at how the curb appeal of their home compares to some of the others. Is it better, is it worse? These are all things that you can do before you ever walk into that listing appointment. Arrive 10 minutes early. Get yourself mentally prepared before you go inside. If you're anything like me, there's nothing more stressful than being late for an appointment. And guys, there's nothing more unprofessional than being late for an appointment. I can pretty much assure you that if you show up late for an appointment and you don't have a really good reason, you're probably not gonna get the listing because now the seller feels like you don't respect their time. And if you don't respect their time, then you don't respect them and they're not gonna give you the business. Give yourself an extra buffer, show up 10 minutes early. Don't walk up to the door 10 minutes early, but just go sit and park and drive around the neighborhood and get a feel for what it is. Get your mind right, get polished, get calm, get confident. When you arrive, ask the seller to give you a tour of the home, noting anything they tell you while you go. 
So what I do is I have a sheet of paper or on my phone, I carry the, the note 10. So I just pop my stylus out and I actually make notes right on my phone as I'm walking through. And I let them know, hey, as we go through the tour, do you mind if I make notes? And they're like, no, of course not. So they're going through and they're like, yeah, we just renovated the kitchen. We just redid the bathrooms. We had fresh sod put down. We had a new roof. We had this, we had this, we had that. I'm making notes of all of it. We just freshly painted. Cool. We replaced this door, whatever it is. Make notes of what they tell you. Get them to know you, like you, and trust you to build that rapport as you're going through. Give them an opportunity to talk but ask the right questions at the right time. You know, as you go through, go, oh, wow, this room is really bright and, you know, whatever. You did a really nice job. Make those comments, build that rapport with them because commenting them is gonna get them to like you and in turn is gonna get them to trust you. Share a little bit about yourself and get to know them. Because at the end of the day, know you like you trust you. It's a two-way street. Ask about any past real estate experiences and when they had them. Get to know a little bit about where they're coming from. Is this the first home they've ever sold or have they sold a bunch of them? Did they have a good experience with their previous agent? If so, why didn't they call that agent to come list it? These are the kinds of things that you have in a conversation. Then as you sit down with them, educate that seller on the market conditions, set expectations of you and of them, and then establish their timeline. How quickly are you looking to get out of this house? You know, do you have to be in another state in 30 days? Okay, cool. That's going to factor how we price this home. These are the kinds of things that you need to keep in the back of your head as you're going through your listing presentation. Establish their wants and needs. What's important to them in choosing a realtor? Ask the question. What is it that you look for in a real estate agent? And I would ask this before you start your listing presentation, because it's going to tell you as you're going through your presentation where you need to stop and pause and reiterate and add extra emphasis. If I don't know what's important to them, I don't know what to focus on. Ask the pointed questions. Ask if they need assistance to help purchase their next home after you get this one sold. Maybe they're looking to move out of state. Okay, cool. Do you have another agent already set up in another state? Well, no, not yet. Awesome. Let me help you. Let me help find you a good one because not all real estate agents are created equally. So let me find you a good one. In turn, you're going to get a 25% referral, but I don't ever focus that much on it. I focus on, I'm providing you a service. Even if I didn't get a referral, it's still a, a service that I would provide because I feel like it's the right thing to do. Go through the process with them. Again, educate them on the process. Go over your marketing plan, explain your paperwork, assist the seller with the pre-listing prep work, order your sign up, your lockbox, your photos, work on your description and prep your marketing set an open house schedule, and explain the process once we have a contract. Buyer's gonna make earnest deposit, they're gonna have an inspection, they're gonna order an appraisal, they're gonna go through underwriting, we're gonna close. Talk through the process with the seller. Let them know what to expect. Because again, more often than not, even if they've been through this process before, they don't know what happens in the background. They've never been told. So go through it with them. You may be surprised how much value taking that little bit of time to talk them through the process will gain you. Set your proper expectations. Using the same statistics as you would with a buyer, explain the market conditions and the environment. Let them know how long homes in the neighborhood have been taking to go under contract. Explain what you intend to do to beat the curve to get their home sold quicker than the rest. Give some examples of marketing pieces that you'll use. You can use the design center in the back office to create it for a different person's listing or whatever, just to show what you do. 
Reiterate the strengths of Florida Luxury Realty with regard to marketing and exposure. Leverage the company as well as yourself. Maybe you're not a super seasoned agent where you have three or four listings where you can show how you market them. Leverage Florida Luxury and what we have. That's how you get ahead. That's how you sell yourself even when you personally don't have a ton to sell. The company does. We've been in business 21 years, sold over $3 billion in real estate. We know what it takes to sell luxury homes and to provide luxury service. Something a seller is gonna care about. So do you guys have any questions about any of the process, anything we talked about? No? All right. Well, then I will leave you guys with that. If you need anything else, if there's anything I can help you with or anything I can do, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, make it a great day, great week, and I will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.